Welcome back to the lesson quiz, uh, six quiz. This is part three. And I believe we left off with number eight. Number seven was B. I think we, we had said that and I had ex tried to explain a little bit about the pre, uh, the advantages of pre-stressing to prevent tension cracks. So we'll go on to number eight. And it says the calculations for the design of a retaining wall show that the resultant force on the base falls out side the middle third of the base how should the design be changed and I don't know if you know what they're talking about but when you design a retaining wall uh, let's say it's a cantilever retaining wall you have the toe, you have the heel, and you have the stem this is the stem this is the toe and this is the heel hope that makes sense All right. And here's your, let's actually change colors here. Go with green. Excuse me. And, sorry, I lost train of thought real quick. And uh, <clears throat> when you do this, you're going to have the weight of the soil. So you're going to have the weight of the soil. Let's, let's say this is the weight of soil that's going to be coming down. It's going to be distributed load right there, but you'll have an equivalent load coming down about right there. You're going to have this weight of the concrete, and let's say that the weight of the concrete, the equivalent, you know, it's like right there. And obviously that's going to be a distributed load as well. And you're going to assume that, that the, the, the concrete is the equally distributed over this bottom right here for kind of a you can call it axial or just bearing pressure is how, how it's simply said, but it's a it's a straight down vertical load. And a lot of times you'll just completely neglect this on the front side. You could also say, okay, well there's soil over here, so we're going to count that on top, anything on top. And over here it's anything on top of that that concrete heel. Over here it's an, you can do this on top of the... So it's a, actually it's a distributed load. So all that is going to... You're going to have all this is going to uh, come down and it's going to put a bearing pressure. So you'll have something pounds per square foot or maybe kips per square foot, depends on what type of wall you're dealing with. So you're going to have, you know, an equivalent or equally distributed load. Yeah, that's not maybe, maybe a little bit confusing, but it's going to look like that. And it's gonna, and then uh, it's gonna come straight down. It's gonna be pretty much. You don't have to say it has to be equally distributed, but let's say in this case it is. And then on on second part, you're gonna also have you know this load coming down at a certain angle. And then you're also going to have so you have all these weight loads, let's call them, or gravity loads. Sorry, not weight loads that that make a, a bearing pressure. And that's if nothing's moving. Now we have this soil, which is going to be pushing. Obviously, that's a little high. Sorry. You might have a surcharge load, which means if you have, let's say you have a truck right here. It's a bad drawing of a truck, but that's all right. There's a little guy inside. All right. So there's a truck, and let's say that makes a, a surcharge load, which means it's, it's, it's just an extra load coming over here. And let's say it's, uh, it's P, and that's going to induce a moment, right? It's going to make it go like this. So you're going to take this moment that it's going to make, and you're going to distribute it like that. In, in any ways, what I'm trying to say is it's going to create this type of another type of force. So you have to add these two together, so you're going to get something like this. And so your max bearing pressure is a, so this this is going up. I don't know if I drew it obvious enough. So it's you're adding this right here and that right there, and it meets this. And here is your max bearing pressure. All right. So hopefully that kind of explains a little bit more of what we're going. It says okay, and this. This when you look at this, I'm sorry, I, I, I need to go a little bit step further. There's a 
you, you make this in, into an equivalent row, right? You, you could cut it right here, and you make one right here, and then you you make one right here. For it's at the third point. This is at the half point. You add those together, and you're going to get one equivalent load. And if that's out, you you can. And if that is outside, that you you break this up into third points. So. And you want to have it within this this middle third point. You want to have that equivalent. And if, this might be a little bit confusing, and they explain it a little bit more in depth in the study guide. That's what they want. They want it in this uh, middle. So they're asking in this uh, question, they said, how should the design be changed to make sure it can get into the middle? Somewhere in the middle here. And you, uh, the footing should be made wider. D is your correct answer. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other ones. A, not at all. Design is inadequate. That's just untrue. The footing should be deepened. Deepening the footing is shouldn't... I guess it could... I mean, it's going to be negligible, but it's going to bring this, it's going to make this a larger load because you're going to have more concrete. So if you have more concrete, it could bring this in ever so slightly. So that's not really incorrect. Incorrect. It's just not the most efficient way to do it. You're going to be, you know, but if you could deepen it to 50 foot. So you could end up making a huge, you know, thing of concrete before you get to a point where this overcomes that offset enough to get it within the, the middle third and I hope that makes sense I know it's a little bit confusing so it's not really incorrect it's just an inefficient way to do it um, C the amount of reinforcing steel should be increased that is not going to help you at all uh, it's gonna make you it stronger but then again it's not going to change any of the loading so that is also incorrect so it's pretty clear cut clear cut it answer to oops sorry about that let's get rid of this the clear cut answer is d all right moving on to number nine sorry my phone's ringing number nine says that the stem of a cantilever retaining wall so we got the cantilever retaining wall something like this and it says the stem which is once again is this part up here it's this part. It's 10 foot high. And it says, assuming a 30 pound equivalent fluid pressure, what is the bending moment at the base caused by the Earth's pressure? And a, a kind of a quicker way to go about this is to say, all right, we know that P, and when I say P is at a, the, the, because we know it's going to be a, a, a wedge, and then it's going to be, this is P, it's going to be a third. So H over 3 up, so it's going to be, what, this is going to be 3.33 foot. So we know, and you, you can actually go back and see, I think one of our questions was H is going to be, we can just use that equation, 30 H squared over 2, I believe is what it was. Let me can we take a quick look and, and justify this. I don't want to be telling you something that's incorrect. Yes, 30H squared over 2. And you can get that by just thinking about it. Thinking that, okay, well, we, we know we have 30, 30 PCF. And you're going to take that to get your wedge. It, you're going to multiply that by how deep it is. And well, actually I'm sure I'm going to call it H. And then to once you have the wedge you need to get the area of the wedge with a triangle an area of a triangle is one half base times height and base is going to be this what we just got times height which is h one half base times height yeah this is a, this is this is b cuz remember this is this dimension right here this is going to be 30h. This is going to be h. And to get the area, you get 1 half 38, and you know that it is at 1 third up is where the centroid of that load is. So the answer, if you plug in h, is going to be 30, 10. Sorry, I'm not putting, I'm, not, I'm just going to skip over the uh, the units here. 
30 times 10 squared is going to be 100. That's 3,000 divided by 2 is 1,500. I hope that makes sense. Oh, well, let's just multiply it out. Maybe my math is incorrect. 30 times 10 squared divided by 2 is 1,500. Like I said, 1,500, and that's going to be in pounds. Then we want to take this 1,500 times 3.33. You need to say 10 divided by 3. So that, I hope that makes sense. So moment equals P times distance. So if you cut it right here, you're going to say your load times distance, and that's moment equals 1,500 pounds times 3.3. Three foot, or I'll tell you what. Let's just do this. Just do ten over three. And that'll get us an exact answer, and that equals five thousand pounds, foot pounds. Sorry. And that's going to be your answer because they were asking for, which I always forget what they're asking. So I go back to the beginning, see what they're asking, and they said, the stem of the cantilever wall. Okay, swimming. What is the bending moment? And that is your bending moment. Moment equals 5,000 foot-pounds. And let's go down, and C is 5,000 foot-pounds, so your answer is C. All right, the last is number 10. I'm just going to clear the whole darn thing. All right, number 10. Select the correct statements about reinforced masonry concrete. And I would just go over and take a look at the masonry concrete. That's If you don't know anything, just read through that, because that's going to give you everything you want to know. Not everything you want to know, but at least everything that they're going to test you on, I assume. Number one is reinforced masonry walls can resist moments caused by earthquake forces or retained earth. And I would say that that is correct. It may not be the best in the world, but if you reinforce, it actually says reinforced masonry. So yes, I would say that is correct. So let's write that down. One, let's look at two, the reinforcing bars stabilized stabilize reinforced masonry walls against the buckling the reinforcing bars stabilize reinforced masonry walls against buckling um that's kind of a, a confusing for me um th is it going to help against buckling well no not not really because if you remember buckling has to do with your eye it actually is KL over R. And R has to do, R is the square root of I over A, I believe, in this radius dry aeration. So if you look at it, it has nothing to do with reinforcing. It has everything to do with your shape, your section properties. So I would say number two is no. Going on to number three, although grout contains more lime, it may also be used interchangeably with mortar. If you look back in there, you will find that that is incorrect. Number four, openings in reinforced masonry walls are generally framed with reinforced masonry, masonry lintels. And if you go to page 107, openings in masonry walls, you'll see that the first, um, the first sentence says, in reinforced masonry walls, openings for doors and windows are usually framed with reinforced masonry lintels. So that would be also correct. So you go down and A is one and four. And that is your answer, A. The one and four correct. And thank you for watching this video, and I hope that uh, this lesson six quiz helped you. I will see you in lesson seven. Have a good day. Bye.